Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly Living Well series. I'm Tara Parker Pope, founding editor of Well, the Times Consumer Health section. Today, I'm so excited to be joined by my friend, Dr. Jordan Metzel. Uh, he's an acclaimed sports medicine physician. I think a lot of you know him. Uh, he he lives his uh, his message of fitness. He's an accomplished marathoner. Dr. Metzel, welcome, Jordan. Tara, thank you so much, and I uh, really appreciate being being here with you. and uh, And thanks for having me on. Well, I know that um, you always you always inspire and motivate me. So I'm I'm looking for a little bit of that today, and I know our. our <laughs> Um, so we're going to talk today about how to keep moving at home, but we also want to hear from you, our listeners. So we'll be taking questions live from all of you. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. If you're dialed in on your phone, press star nine to raise your hand. If you're chosen to ask a question, you'll hear from our producers in the chat when you're on deck. Once you're on the air, I'll call your name. Please give us your name and where you are calling from. We'll try to get to as many people as possible. So try to keep your questions brief. We wanna, we wanna answer as much as we can today with Dr. Metzl. Also note, this event is being recorded. So let's get started. Uh, start checking in with your questions and, and we're gonna chat for a bit and then we'll start taking your questions. So, hey, Jordan, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing okay, Tara. Thank you so much. And uh, you know, thanks for this forum. I think it's important to talk about what we're gonna talk about today, which is the importance of movement yeah, uh, no. as part of this pandemic. How have, just tell me quickly how your life has changed professionally and personally since we've all been in lockdown. Yeah, um, so it was really interesting because uh, in, in February, February was a pretty normal month. I, I got to go to the Super Bowl and watch my, even though I live in New York, I grew up, as you know, in Kansas City, and I got to go see my Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, and wow. life was awesome. And, and then mid-February, we started getting emails about a COVID-19 task force being set up in the hospital. And it was interesting because they were sending us these emails and it was a concept and I'd never, you know, I'd read about pandemics in medical school. I'd never lived through a pandemic. I didn't, you know, completely understand what it was, um, as did most of my colleagues. And, uh, and we were getting then increasingly these very concerned emails from this uh, COVID task force being set up at Cornell and, and uh, Hospital for Special Surgery where I work. And I would go outside at the end of the day and the restaurants were full, the city was bustling. I mean, there was just so much normal activity going on outside and we were getting these impending doom messages on the inside. And it was just really for about a week and a half or two weeks, this huge disconnect. Right. And then all of a sudden at the beginning of March, um, as everybody knows, everything changed very quickly. And as a sports medicine doctor, uh, within about two days, they said, you're gonna finish seeing patients on Tuesday and um, as of Wednesday, your practice and everybody's practice is, is basically shut down and we're going to start you on telemedicine, which I'd heard about. And, and like all my colleagues at HSS, nobody had really ever done. We had a telemedicine working group and I think there were just several physicians signed up to be part of it at the beginning. And all of a sudden they had to upload and on-ramp hundreds of us, um, teach us what to do. And then we had to start tele-networking with our patients while simultaneously um, they set up a whole perimeter of orthopedic emergency centers that they sent us out to man to try and keep our patients outside of the emergency room where there was a lot of COVID uh, happening. And then finally, HSS became an overflow center from Cornell for a number of the COVID patients, especially ventilated patients, um, which are, we are now done with, but we did uh, when at the height of the, of, the, of the surge. And so there were just a huge number of things that started happening at the same time and the practice of medicine went from being in person where I would see, you know, 25, 30 patients a day in my office to trying to give that information uh, virtually. And at the beginning, it was a bit awkward. And now as I'm getting more into it, um, you know, I, I'm certainly looking forward and, and just starting now to see patients back in person uh, in a socially distanced way, which we can certainly talk about. But, you know, the idea of giving people information and actionable things to do and, and things to work on, on virtual care, going over their MRIs and looking at their knees and shoulders is something I had to learn how to do um, and then learn how to do meaningful ways to get them to do physical therapy at home on telemedicine or telephysical therapy or teletraining. And, and so in some ways, it's been a real period of growth and learning while simultaneously trying to keep people healthy and you know, do my job as a doctor. So that's kind of the doctor piece. You know, one of the things I've heard from doctors is that they're learning so much right now, but one thing they're learning is how much care you can actually give 
over a video chat, that you can still provide a pretty high level of care. It's not the same as in person, but I do think it's probably going to change a lot going forward. And it is one of the more positive lessons of this horrible time, I think, the ability to use telemedicine in an effective way. Now, what about your personal life? I know you are a big runner, you're, you cycle. How has all of this affected your ability to exercise? Well, it's interesting because um, as you know, and you've, you've come and been part of these, Tara. So uh, in addition to my sports medicine practice, I started this whole fitness community about seven years ago. And uh, our great colleague, your great colleague, Anna Head O'Connor was one of the first uh, times folks to come out and do a workout with me in Central Park. And I started this whole idea of starting a physician-led fitness community because I felt like doctors were doing a great job at dispensing health information, but I thought it would be even better if I could dispense the medicine of exercise to my community. So we started off really small. And you know, by the beginning of March, we were up to over 50,000 people on our listserv where people could sign up and take our classes in person. And we had all kinds of big venues to do that. And then all of a sudden, when everything shut down, I had this huge community of people and really no way to activate them to big workouts. And so took the whole idea of fitness and kind of started developing a whole virtual community fitness. And, and that started and now has kind of similarly grown to this whole idea of exercising. We had a class on Saturday with almost a thousand people from all over the world. Somebody from Mumbai, somebody from, we had a trainer in Brazil. I was here. We're doing one next weekend from Israel. So the idea of, of basically preaching and getting people to move has also gone very virtual and, and in a really neat way. And, and so for myself, a lot of that and a lot of the educational webinars and things I've been working on are giving people the right information on how to keep moving while simultaneously keeping myself moving. Because I think, as you know, um, I deeply believe in the medicine of movement every single day and have started a whole course at Cornell on prescribing the medicine of exercise um, with a number of my colleagues. And so I, I feel so strongly that it's important and I want people to make sure they're getting that message and continuing to move. Yeah, I want to start taking some listener questions, but one of the things I want to talk about as we as we go through these questions is something you said to me, that there's still a lot we don't know about coronavirus. Um, there's still so much to learn. But one thing we absolutely do know a lot about is how important exercise is for our bodies and the negative effects of being sedentary. So I think just to, you know, you want to comment on that quickly, and then we'll, we're going to take Nancy as our first question. Sure, I'd love to. Um, so I actually, I've been thinking about a couple of patients I saw today just on my telemedicine. So this morning, I saw a wonderful patient of mine who lives on the Upper West Side in New York City, and she has Parkinson's. And with her Parkinson's, she's been able to control much of her symptoms with strength training and exercise. And so she's a regular at our classes in Central Park. And um, she even, you know, she's, she's an inspirational person that, that really uses exercise to modify her symptoms. Parkinson's is one of the diseases where we know that regular exercise really helps in terms of disease expression. Uh, and so, you know, when I saw her today, I asked about how she was doing and in her back and her knee and how she's feeling. And, and in addition to taking care of those things, you know, she's somebody I want to make sure she stays on her exercise program. She said, listen, I'm having a hard time because I can't get outside. My gym is closed. So we set her up with a, with a basically a remote trainer who's going to now start training her um, starting uh, this week. And that's going to be very beneficial and likewise, uh, you know, I've seen a number of my patients with different types of conditions where I want them to work on exercise. And so, you know, there's so many different equations for people, but this interface of medicine and fitness and wellness, they're all part of the same equation. And, and I think as the resources become less for people, it's important to try and keep them moving. All right. So let's take a question. Nancy, um, tell us where you're calling from and ask us your question. Make sure you unmute. Sorry, I did that by mistake. No problem, Nancy. Welcome. <laughs> no, I didn't have a question. I, I must have uh, put something on there by mistake. Well, we're glad <laughs> that you're here. Uh, please keep listening and enjoy. Um, we're, we're glad that you're interested. So let's take a question now from Judy. Judy, can you unmute your, your uh, Zoom and ask your question? We could tell some jokes in the uh, in the interim here. I know this is one of the challenges of Zoom, but I believe Judy is there. Judy, do you want to ask us your question? Judy, you need to unmute your Zoom. Can you go to the lower left portion of your screen and click on the mute button so you can unmute? And we give you a few seconds to do that. We can maybe come back to you. Uh, this is one of the fun parts of Zoom. Um, Let's try Jody. 
Jody, are you there? <laughs> okay, while we're waiting, we're gonna ask now Catherine. If Catherine doesn't jump in, Jordan, give us an idea of how, um, have, have people talked to you about a lack of motivation during the pandemic? Well, it's interesting. So as I've been kind of looking at, uh, at this need to keep people moving because you know as i've kind of talked about with you um tara that uh, you know all these different chronic diseases heart disease diabetes arthritis my patients with parkinson's i talked about this morning you know those diseases are still very much ongoing and among the best medicines we have for those diseases is really daily movement but when that's taken away from people in a way they're used to doing it you know those diseases can keep progressing and become more difficult to treat um, and then another piece of this is just the motivational piece of going to a class or being part of a community. Right. And that's why I've been doing all that stuff. So I've had a lot of patients talk to me about, you know, I'm feeling unmotivated. It's very difficult. I'm not sure how to do that. And that's why when I think about the things that, that really have been successful with uh, initiatives of getting people to exercise remotely, um, and you look at some of the different programs, some of the different apps, you know, the things that are the best are things that are fun, they're community-based, people are having a good time. Somebody's working there. And, uh, yeah, I had a question. Hello to both of you. This is so much fun. I've been um, trying to walk up my stairs. Uh, I do it about six times and I'm in a 12-story building and it feels like a darn good workout to this 51-year-old. Um, I wonder, Tara, if either you or Dr. Metzl had any ideas about, uh, you know, how frequently, what I can do to make it harder, how I can build up, what other kinds of stuff do. And there's a second part to my question, which is that I have teens who are deeply resistant to exercising at all and, and really dislike hearing from their mother that they need to get up and move. So that's a one-two punch for you. And uh, thanks both for what you're doing. I'll look forward to hearing your thoughts. Yeah, thanks for your question. So Jordan, what do you think about stair workouts in buildings? Let's start with so, that. Sure, so the American College of Sports Medicine recommends about a half hour of moderate intensity per day to really start reaping the health benefits. Now I'm a big believer when possible of getting outside to move. So I think that doing some inside is great, Kathy, but I would love for you to get outside. I think fresh air has a number of benefits um, you know, including, you know, it makes you feel better. There was a big study in Norway looking at outside versus inside exercisers and the effective outside exercise uh, seemed to be better in terms of mood. So I think there's a lot of outside exercise help. Plus I think just, you know, clearing out your lungs and getting out there I think is, is val valuable. So um, in terms of what types of exercise, uh, you know, we find that the biggest issue with uh, getting people to exercise regularly is if they like what they're doing. So exercise compliance goes up with enjoyment. So for me, if you said, um, go walk up 12 flights of stairs uh, multiple times every single day, I would be like, uh, I'm not so excited about that, but I would love to go outside for a run. But maybe for you, going outside for a run just seems like terrible and you wanna walk up the stairs. And so if you like walking up those stairs and you're doing it for about a half hour, I think that's awesome. Um, if you don't like walking up the stairs, then I would try, try and think about varying what you're doing. As for the unmotivated teen syndrome, um, so that's a tough one. Uh, I think what we do know is that community and fun make the biggest difference. And so maybe you may want to talk to your teens about what kind of things would get them motivated. So maybe they want to do, I mean, there's so many different options now of different communities and classes that are streaming free or next to free workouts on Zoom. And, and there's just literally thousands of these opportunities, all different types of things. And so, I think this is a great time to be a little bit creative and trying to figure out what they might like to do. Maybe one kid wants to do yoga, one kid wants to do uh, dance cardio, one kid wants to do boxing, one kid wants to do HIIT workouts. Um, I think as long as they're doing something, but I do think this is a good time to put your maternal foot down just a little bit because I think it's important to have them moving because just sitting around all day doing nothing, we know has such deleterious health effects starting in adolescence. So I think get after them a little bit. Our next question is from Dawn. And while Dawn, you're unmuting, I wanted just to add for Catherine, I would say that in indoor spaces, just a reminder that if you're exercising on stairs and touching handrails to make sure that you're washing your hands, um, because these common areas in apartment buildings, you know, a lot of people use that. So just, you know, be mindful. But I love the idea of taking the stairs instead of the elevator. Um, I think that's great during a pandemic. Uh, so that makes a lot of sense to me. But maybe take the stairs on your way outside to exercise, right, Jordan? Um, Dawn, what's your question? Can you hear me? Yes, Dawn, welcome. Oh, wonderful, great. So I'm a runner too, 
And I want to know if it's safe to run with one or more friends, mm. and do we have to wear masks? This is such a common question. What do you think, Jordan? I have some thoughts. So, I know you do. I know you do. All right. So um, we've got two, two points on this. A, I think running is, is very helpful for people. And, uh, and I do encourage people to get out and run and move outside. And if you're a runner, it's important to keep running. Um, now, there's been a number of, you know, as you know, we are on an outside, you know, when you're outside wearing face protection uh, phase. And, you know, I think that's really important to honor that. Um, people got very, very concerned when that model was put up from Belgium that showed like the runner and the biker and the spread behind. And if you're like behind me, you're going to get the virus anywhere like 10 feet behind me in a spread area. And, you know, I'd, I'd say that having reviewed the, the literature almost every day on these issues, and I know Tara does as well, I've not been impressed thus far with outside spread as nearly as worrisome if worrisome as compared to inside spread. So, you know, things like, you know, the choir where many of the people in the choir got, uh, got COVID in an indoor singing is very different than being outside. That being said, I think there's two issues here. There's the medical piece and then there's the making everybody feel comfortable around you piece. And I think they're both important. Now, I mean, this is the time of life where we want to look out for our neighbors and respect our neighbors. And I think that's equally valuable than you know, than almost anything. I wouldn't say it's as important as viral transmission, but it's darn close. And so my recommendation is, is A, I think running with a friend, as long as you're, you know, six feet or so apart is fine. Um, I think I do that all the time. And I think that's great. And B, I think getting one of those slide up uh, buffs or something that covers your nose and your mouth, I think running in a surgical mask is very tough. Yeah. Um, but I think running with a buff and if there's anybody around you, you pull it up. And if nobody's around, you pull it down. I think that's a good compromise. Um, Tara, I don't know if you feel that that's acceptable because I know we talked I about it before. I agree that the, the risk of outside transmission is incredibly low. I feel very safe when I'm outside and I'm social distancing. I don't love it when I'm on a walking path and a runner comes close to me panting without you know face covering. I think if runners stay in their lane and I stay in my lane, it works out better. I would appreciate, I think runners need to be aware that people are afraid and that as you pant by me, that creates fear. And I think that if you just are courteous, just like I'm courteous, I'm not gonna be walking slowly in a running lane. And I shouldn't be, I shouldn't have my dog there. You know, that's for the runners. I'm thinking about Central Park, which is, I live near Central Park. But you know, there are a lot of really open spaces where runners you know, around the country can go. And I do think that running is so healthy and, and you can get deconditioned so quickly. So yeah, I wish I could run, I have a bad knee, but uh, yes, I think people should run. I think they should be very aware of their running partners, uh, sort of standards for distancing. You know, is your partner somebody that's being careful or are they being careless? I would run with somebody that I had confidence, you know, that they are staying home and taking precautions, but we all have to start also living our lives, right? And um, finding a way to coexist with uh, people of all levels of, you know, there are the inconsiderate people who don't wear masks at all who are walking and not running. And I'm actually probably more concerned about those people because I think they're really not taking care of themselves and yeah. they're not taking care of their community, right? Tara, I'm gonna throw in one, one other thought too, and thinking back to Catherine's questions before, and that we are seeing people who are exercising but there is another term that we use called NEAT, which is called non-exercise active thermogenesis. And that is simply just everyday walking around uh, expenditure of energy. So things you're used to like walking to the bus or walking to work or going out to walk down to the corner or walk to the grocery store. And there are so many forms of daily movement that are really significantly restricted right now and people are less likely to do so. They may exercise, but they're not, their NEAT profiles are way diminished compared to where they were. And you know the thought is that that neat profile is a huge part of what it means to be healthy as well. And so you know, with diminished neat profiles, I want people to think about figuring out ways in their own comfort zone to increase their neat profile. Maybe it's getting out a couple times a day just to go for a smaller walk. Um, I think that's really important. And I just wanted to, when I heard Catherine's question about the stairs, I wanted to make sure we we talked about neat as a way to you know just be, being conscious not only of your exercise time but also of your neat profile. Yeah, we're going to take a question from Mary, and I would just add to that that you know, if you look at your phone now, the number of steps that we take daily has just plummeted because you know I'm not commuting, I'm not using the subway, I'm not walking across the office, and it's really an effort to try to replicate the steps of my morning commute and my evening commute. 
And I'm sorry, that was my phone. And so, you know, I, I do think we have to be aware of all the movement that's not happening. I've actually started, I'm very inspired by the song Physical by Dua Lipa. Do you know this song? This is the most fun song. <laughs> and I started playing it throughout the day. And I'm not kidding. I get up and I, I just kind of dance around my living room because I'm thinking about, I'm so sedentary sitting here at my laptop all day. And it's such a nice mental break. And it just lifts me and I just, it adds some movement to my day. So um, I think Mary is off mute. Mary, what's your question? Hi, I'm Mary from Brantford, Connecticut. And I'm uh, very fit and I've always played tennis three or four times a week, go to the gym three or four times a week. And I'm going to have to have a knee replacement in uh, July. So those avenues are not open to me now to go to the gym. And I'm trying to use the limited weights and things I have at home to get ready for the surgery. Do you have any other suggestions? You have your so Mary, the right doc. <laughs> Mary, that's a great question. And we certainly manage a lot of our patients with arthritic knees with, you know, things like strengthening and injections and all types of things to keep their symptoms at bay for a long period of time. At some point, that stuff doesn't work anymore for some people and they get to a point where they're going to think about a knee replacement. So I guess I've had a few, a bunch of patients with this, and I, I want to answer a couple of th thoughts on this. First of all, I've had a lot of questions on, should I get a knee replacement right now? And the answer is that um, depending on where you are in the country, depending on, or the world, depending on the, you know, the COVID penetrance where you are, um, I think those are all things to think about. And how much do you need to get it now versus is it, would you rather wait a year? And I think, that, you know, those are important questions that I've had with my patients. And I don't have the exact answer for, because it's a person to person thing. But I think those are certainly things to think about. And hopefully by July, we will have a much better handle on antigen testing and knowing um, you know, all those types of things that are gonna make a difference in terms of how we manage patients, uh, both outpatient and inpatient and things like surgeries, et cetera. And I'm, I'm guessing by July, we'll be much further along with that. But the other piece is the role of prehabilitation or keeping your muscles strong before a surgery. And that's hugely important. And so what I would recommend, Mary, that you do is I would reach out to the doctor that's going to be doing your knee replacement. And I would ask that exact question to their office. And my bet is what they will do is start you on some remote physical therapy, telephysical therapy to work on strengthening your muscles at home. So when it's time for your knee replacement, you do much better because we want those muscles as strong as they can possibly be when it's time for your knee replacement. All right. Thanks. So Matt, are you uh, ready with your question? We'd love to hear from you and tell us where you're calling from. I'm coming in now. How are you? Hi, Matt. Welcome. Hi, I reside here in Manhattan, in New York City, and uh, I'm a creature of habit. I, go to, I walk to work every day and uh, go to the New York Sports Club and every day do my spin, classing, spin classes. I like a spin class. I like being around people. And for me, motivation-wise, I'm up early in the morning. I go to Stuyvesant Park, and I do a couple of loops around there, and I'm just not perspiring the same way. I, I put on a couple of pounds and I just, and I'm not just, just not a fan of these video workouts as well. And also in addition, how do I, what are good ways to work my core muscles? Um, I've always been into Pilates and stretching and I kind of, I'm in a small apartment, I'm working from home. What do you recommend uh, to work the core muscles, especially, um, you know, when I'm not at a gym at a gym at? Great questions, Matt. Thank you. So uh, how do you step up the intensity of an outdoor workout if you don't like an indoor workout? And how do you work out your core? Great questions, Matt. Thank you so much. And I'd uh, love to hear from you. So basically, um, you know, this is a time to think about uh, what, you know, how can I put some more intensity in my life? And it's interesting because we believe that, you know, we, we haven't talked about exercise and immune function, but there certainly is evidence that if you exercise over your threshold, which Matt, I'm not worried about you at all, but people that exercise way over their threshold run the risk of depleting their immune system and being more susceptible to any infection, which is why marathon runners are much more likely to get a cold two to three days after they run the marathon because they can really deplete um, their hormonal immune response and they're much more likely to get an infection. Um, but Matt, in your case, I want to put some more intensity into your life. And I think one of the things you were probably getting at the spin class was you were, you know, getting all the great energy from everybody else. There was an interesting study that was done uh, at Oxford uh, several years ago where they took a bunch of rowers and they had them max out their erg on their rowing machine. And they, had, they put the same rowers in a room and they were about 15 to 20% higher in a group than they were by themselves. So there's really solid evidence that being in a group really helps you. That being said, 
I do think, Matt, it sounds like you could put in some more HIT or high intensity interval training into your life. And one resource that I worked on with the New York Times is something called the nine minute workout. Um, and if you can just put that in your browser and Google it, your our nine minute workout will come popping up. There's a little PDF you can save on your phone and just start. There's some example videos and you can just do a minute per box and follow that thing. And we put that together. It's a body weight workout. You can do it outside, wherever you are and try that first. I think that will help you a lot. And in that I have several different core muscle exercises that will help the core muscles are the muscles in the front and the back of the spine. The stronger those are, the better your back feels and the better you'll feel. I'm seeing a lot of complaints of back pain from people just sitting around all day hunched over their computer. And so getting up to move in whatever way I think is really valuable. So let me be clear. So what you're saying is, as I go on my walk, you know, a couple minutes into my walk, stop and do some lunges, a couple more minutes, at, you know, at a higher intensity, and then walk. So what would be the breakdown? A minute of walk or two minutes of walk, and then the exercise, what would you suggest? Yeah, so I think it'd be great, you know, every couple minutes, let's say you, let's say you give me a minute of something intense every two minutes, um, would be, I would love that. Um, and so, you know, the, and then I'm going to work out, goes through all those different types of things. In fact, one of my nurses, I used to kind of, uh, get in her face a little bit about not exercising. So we made a deal that every red light on the way from the subway to my office, she would stop and do squats at the light. And now she's a dedicated squatter. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to think about changing that behavior. I love this idea though of stopping and doing a plank uh, for, a cup, for a minute, you know, as I'm walking. So that's great. Um, Kathy, we would love to hear your question. Where are you calling from? And please unmute your Zoom if you can. Okay, hi. <laughs> from Central New Jersey, and I am someone with osteoporosis, and I know I need to do weight-bearing exercise, and I'm wondering if- Hey, Kathy? Yes. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Can you get a little closer to your mic? Okay, sure, yeah. I'm calling from Central New Jersey. I am somebody with osteoporosis, so I know I need to do weight-bearing exercise, and I'm wondering, normally I would do that at the gym, and I'm wondering what kinds of things I can do at home. Um, Kathy, that's a great question. Thank you so much for asking. So osteoporosis or uh, basically having, there are two conditions we commonly see in people, osteoporosis, low bone density, or osteoarthritis when the bones start to wear down at the ends and the joints. And both of these things, um, if you stop exercising and you lose more muscle strength, um, those things, you know, the osteoarthritic symptoms can certainly get worse. And we know for oste osteoporosis that weight training can help uh, a little bit in, in um, and uh, bone density uh, loss and acquisition. So there's a lot of value for strength training, Kathy. Um, and so there's a lot that can be done. Um, I know one of Tara's favorites, not only did we do the nine minute, Tara, but I think you were a big fan, was it the seven? What, what's the workout that was a uh, well, we seven created, minute workout you guys said? We created a six minute workout that we six. have videos for, which if you look up the New York Times six minute workout, it's, it's great for people who are Maybe not in, you know, as fit as you are, Jordan. Um, you know, it's got lower intensity, lower, I'm sorry, lower impact, not lower intensity, lower impact exercises. So let's, that may be a good idea for Kathy to start. Kathy, find that six minute workout and start doing some of that. Maybe that may be helpful because again, with a little bit of people um, do very well if they just have a, a little grid. I know it's better with a class, um, you know, but, but even in the short term, having a grid and just following a grid is, is helpful for people. Yeah, I think I do love, I was watching the six minute workout the other day and it's actually pretty fun. I like it. Um, Naomi has a question for us. Naomi, where are you calling from? Naomi, we have about 15 minutes left. So we're gonna try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, hopefully Naomi is there. If not, we can move on to Marsha. Marsha, what's your question? Tell us where you're calling from. Zoom is a challenge. I still have problems with it and I use it quite a lot. <laughs> Marsha, are you there? Can you unmute your Zoom, please? Oh, Sorry. I'm here. Can you hear me? I'm from Hi, Marcia, welcome. Um, Yes, um, I'm 76 years old. Uh, actually, I'm doing a Zoom, virtual Zoom class at the same time. It just happened to work. The, so I, I'm listening and doing my, some exercise. Um, I have osteoarthritis in my knee, and I wake up every morning with, I could just about walk down the stairs, but after breakfast, you know, by the time my legs work out, you know, I'm, I'm fine, you know, so I can do exercises and everything. Is there anything, I mean, I've been to doctors, I've had my veins worked on and injected and everything, but I just, you know, have constant pains in my legs 
But you know, once I, I get moving in the morning, I'm okay. But, and I, so I, I wind up taking two ibuprofen to get me started. But it, you know, is that okay for me to do? <laughs> Do you think, doctor? Sure, so um, thanks, Marcia, for the questions. Um, here's what I would tell you, um, that when, you know, when people have arthritic knees particularly, and which is I see all the time in my office, you know, I, I get them to work on getting the, the muscles going and start bending, but sometimes that's not enough. And the problem is when your knee is sore, the body has this kind of feedback loop where if the knee is sore, then the muscles around the knee start to get weaker. And as the muscles get weaker, it gets more sore. So we're often kind of feel like Sisyphus kind of pushing a rock up the hill and it just kind of comes right back down on us. So what we like to do is combine something to reduce the symptoms in the knee while simultaneously working on muscle strengthening. And so it sounds like you're at a point where we would consider putting some of these lubricants into your knee that can help reduce some of the grinding in your knee and allow you to build strength. And so your doctor, wherever you are, can talk to you about that. And in terms of visiting the doctor, I just want to kind of mention this really quickly as well, because I know a lot of people are concerned, rightfully so, that they don't want to put themselves into a position where there's more people that could potentially, you know, the more social contacts, the riskier the situation. So, you know, I think that you want to, when you talk about visiting your doctor, you want to see what kind of precautions that they have in place at the office you're going to. Are they doing appropriate social distancing? Are they doing terminal cleaning? Have they done that? What kind of patients have been in that space? Those are all important questions to ask, but I think certainly it sounds like for you, Marcia, you may want to think about some of these injectable lubricants in your knee that we call visco supplements that can help reduce the symptoms of arthritis while allowing you to build strength. All right, we're going to take a question now from Wendy. Um, I do see a question in the chat. Somebody's asking where you can find the six minute workout. I'm trying to actually get that posted today on nytimes.com slash well. So it will be there. If not now, it'll be there soon. You can also just Google a six minute workout, New York Times, and you'll find it. You'll find a story, you know, in six minutes, you can be done with your workout and you'll find three workout videos. So it's a lot of fun. So check it out. Wendy, are you here? Where are you calling? Yep. Yes, hello. Um, I am from New Jersey. Uh, I heard Doctor, you mentioned Cornell. I am a Cornell alum. Um, I'm uh, 59, degree, 59 years old and I've been pretty active. I'm typically a big tennis player and a big skier. Um, but lately, the last few, last week or so, I've had a lot of pain in one of my shoulders, actually my left shoulder, and I think it's because of sleeping. And then it's, of course, making it hard to sleep. And so I'm just wondering if you have any ideas on that. Sure, Wendy. Well, obviously sleep, you know, is a big piece of staying healthy. And if you can't sleep, uh, you know, it, 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 for mind and body, it's not good for you. Um, so this is a perfect example. I think the last caller and definitely Wendy were somebody, these are the kinds of patients that we're certainly seeing now on telemedicine. So we would see somebody like Wendy we would kind of virtually examine their shoulder, try and get an idea what it is, and then hook her up with a virtual physical therapist to work on some exercises you know, from New Jersey, where she is, to start the first step of trying to get her better. And many of our patients were just fixing like that until we can see them in real life. And that's been, you know, the neat thing about that is we're doing it, you know, I have a patient I saw um, last week who was in, in Dubai, and I did it to Dubai, the same kind of idea. So it really helps spread the concept of what it means like what you're doing but wendy i think that's a good idea for you just because then you can get a little bit of help in terms of fixing this pain which should be pretty it sounds like a little bit of shoulder impingement or pinching in the shoulder that we can usually fix just with some exercises and although it's easier to see you in person it's pretty good to see you virtually as a first step do you have any examples of things people can do i mean or does it does it depend on what the injury is you don't want to prescribe depends on what it is Okay. Correct. So, yeah, so that's why I get that. Yeah. You should reach out to her doctor and try to do a telemedicine visit to, visit to get I some think so. Because I have to say, all of us, we're sleeping kind of funny, we're stressed, and we're feeling a lot of aches. Um, we have a question from Francine. Francine, where are you calling from? Hi, I'm from Chicago. Excellent. You and I have actually worked on financial planning articles. To, oh, no, maybe not. We worked on some kind of article. The other Tara, there's two Taras at the New York Times with hyphenated names. I have, that's probably who else you worked it with. It was the other one. You're right. Bernard. At any rate, I have two things. Number one, is there a way to access last week's podcast with Jane Brody? Yes, I'm going to answer that very quickly. Everybody, you can go to, uh, what is it, timesevents.com? Is that it right? Uh, and no, it's not. It's, it's, um, I'm going to tell you the name. It's uh, timesevents.nytimes.com. And go to the bottom of the page and click on 
the past events. And you can find all of our past events. You can find all of the pa times past events, the living well past events, and you can find Jane Brody there. So that question is answered. So what's your next thank, question? Thank you very much. My other question, I am 66 years old and I find that um, I need to stretch. And I was wondering if you know of any online videos to help you with that or any suggestions you can do. I noticed in particular like hamstrings and glutes and I'm sure it's from sitting so long. I, you know, I've been, you know, uncomfortable. I've been missing my Pilates classes. I'm still going out for long walks, which was great, but you know, it's the stretching part that I could use some guidance. All right, great question. Jordan, what about stretching? You have some other Yeah, so we're seeing so many people with these kind of soft tissue complaints, achy backs, achy shoulders, achy necks. And so there's a few things that I've had people starting to do. Number one is if you're like going to the Y or wherever it is your gym you typically go to, I think you should definitely, there's so many virtual options and even free virtual options and you can just hunt around. And um, one thing, Francine, you can probably do is just put in, uh, you know, kind of free, stretch video free stretch class and i think you'd be amazed what'll come popping up on at, at different things to try so i would definitely just hunt around and try some of that there are a whole host of studios doing free yoga classes and there's tons of those that i think would be helpful to kind of loosen up and then the other thing that i'm seeing a lot more of is this myofascial tightening where you're actually you know all this soft tissue just tightens up and sometimes stretching alone doesn't help and so i think things like foam rolling um, in, in, our, in our New York Times knee guide, we had a whole thing about how to use a foam roller. I know we put some in there. I'm sure there's other places as well in the Times. Um, and that's very helpful to loosen up that soft tissue. And then there have been some of these different products that have come out. You've seen these percussive guns that loosen up soft tissue. And I have a number of my patients get those. And I think those really help as well um, as ideas to start thinking about loosening up that soft tissue. All right, great. Um, we also have a yoga for everyone guide at the New York Times for beginners. Um, so look up the New York Times guides to yoga and you might find some uh, great videos and, and help there. And I know at the end of the six minute workout, we have some wonderful yoga, uh, yoga poses that you can do that feel pretty great. Um, and I did just get a note that the uh, six minute workout is on the NY, uh, nytimes.com slash well. Uh, site now so you can find the six minute workout there. The next call is from Jerry. Jerry, where are you calling from? Hi Jerry, you need to unmute your your audio at the lower left portion of your Zoom screen and we'd love to hear your question. Do you hear me now? Hi Jerry, yes, welcome. Hi, how are you? Great. Dr. Metzel is my uh, was my doctor because I have a bum left knee and he's terrific and I miss him because I live part-time in uh, New York and part-time in Maine and we decided to give Maine a, a try and I've been here for uh, I think three years. Um, I have a, a uh, I was doing a uh, swimming five days a week doing lap swimming as a way to deal with not having non-impact uh, exercise but that's out right now, and I'm pretty, uh, I, I did the big eight, six, 86 in April, and uh, I'm pretty much homebound. It's delightful in many ways, but uh, I, I'm not exercising. I do a little bit of walking, but my left, left knee is not the greatest. <laughs> what, so, you're, so you're looking for some alternative uh, to swimming? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, just things I could do at home as soon as, Hopefully right. this comes to a close, if that's ever, uh, I'll swim again because that's a non-impact sport. Okay. And I was swimming a mile uh, every time I went. All right, uh, Jordan, you wanna tackle this? This is tough. A lot of people miss their swimming routines. I got you, Jerry. It's so nice to hear from you and thank you so much for saying hello. I, li I remember you exactly and I love hearing your voice. Um, so what I would say is that uh, although swimming is the easiest for you and the easiest on your body, the main issue is your body doesn't know that there's a pandemic going on or anything that your body doesn't know the pool's closed. Your body just knows that you're 86 and you're not moving enough. And so even though swimming is the preferred course and you know, pretty soon in May, you may be able to go outside in the ocean, who knows, um, or some protected pond or something, but until that's possible, I think you have to hunt around and figure out what things are doable on your end. So maybe that's, you know, the yoga videos that Tara was talking about. Maybe that's finding some Pilates or maybe that's putting in your 
uh, browser, you know, you know, exercise classes for people over 80 and see what she shows up. And this is a great time to experiment, to hunt around and to find things that you uh, like or that you're willing to try. But the main issue is that um, not moving is really not an option um, because you made it so far and we're not letting some little stupid piece of RNA stand in the way from you getting further. So you've got to keep moving, right? Our next question is from Michelle. Um, Michelle, while you're unmuting, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Dr. Metzl a quick question. Do you have any thoughts on how soon pools might be allowed to open? What are your thoughts? On, I mean, the pool water itself is pretty safe. It's just the social part of it. It's being yeah, around. I think I, you know, I could see outdoor pools being open a lot sooner than indoor. Um, so I think that I think we'll see outdoor before indoor. Uh, for that reason, I think it's it's not the pool; it's the uh, it's the respiratory droplets in a closed environment that are so worrisome. So I think that's the problem with indoor pools. Yeah, I know people miss their pools. Michelle, where are you calling from? Hi, folks. I'm calling from Mansfield, Massachusetts. Great. I love New York. I miss it, and I can't wait to come back when we can. My question is sort of psychological, which is I put a tickler on my calendar every day to get up and go out, and I ignore it every day. <laughs> So my question is more like, how do you get the motivation to really pay attention to all this advice you've given us today? So this is the question, right? I mean, how we know we need to exercise, we know it's good for us. How, what are some tips that you have to help us stay motivated, to help us just get moving and get out of the house? That's a great question, Michelle. Thanks for asking. And I've been dealing with this a lot. And I think there are really four components to uh, that have been studied that make exercise programs uh, compliant, make people compliant. And those include fun, community, incentive-based, and there's a fourth, which I will get to as soon as I remember, sorry, that I'm having a moment. But those are the first three, another no, 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 fun, community, incentive-based, uh, and there's a fourth one. But anyway, so the, the bottom line here is that, you know, the programs that seem to be working are ones, you know, with these remote things are ones that combine fun and incentive. So you get a sticker or a, or a kudos or whatever. And so I want you to think about um, what are the things you can do to put incentive into what you're doing? Because obviously just the tickler in your calendar isn't incentive enough because you're going right by it. So maybe that's calling your friend or sibling or something say, listen, I want to go out walking at 730 in the morning, I want you to join me and let's do a virtual walk. I'm in here and you're there and let's do that together. Having another person being accountable, building a virtual community has been shown to be as effective as, uh, as you know, having a community in person in, in your place. So I think that's, I, I try to say that's probably the best first step for you is try and enlist people to make a community that keeps you accountable because obviously just being accountable alone is tough. So you want to think about, uh, being accountable to somebody else. I would say that's probably the different things that are probably the best, easiest first step. And I'm gonna think of the fourth leg of the table in a second. <laughs> I would also add that tying, tying your exercise to some habit you already have, like uh, if you're brushing your teeth, maybe after you brush your teeth, doing some wall push-ups, or uh, you know, thinking about picking you know, a routine, you know, creating a habit, um, the time in your day that is easiest for you. And I think that we just have to start thinking about self-care and we have to start thinking about why we wanna be well and why we wanna stay healthy and the people we love and, and use that to motivate us. And I also uh, recently just bought a bunch of great leggings and exercise clothes because I just wanted to motivate myself. So I started with a little shopping therapy, a little retail therapy, and um, it has helped. Uh, having the right gear, right, George? Just having gear. You bet, you bet. Make just feeling, feeling positive about what you're doing and making it you know something special I think that's a great point Tara absolutely and I think this is a great question and maybe I'll write a future column or work with Gretchen Reynolds our phys ed columnist and Jordan about finding all the ways to stay motivated uh, during this time because we really do have to keep moving so I want to thank everybody so much for joining us today especially to you Jordan for answering our questions it's always so great to see you I love seeing you and love seeing everybody thank you so much for having me We'll have to have you again. This event is a weekly series that takes place Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we hope you'll join us right back here next week. We're going to be talking to Donald G. McNeil. He's a science writer. He's going to talk to us a little bit about what the new normal looks like and how we're going to uh, move forward. It's going to be really interesting um, because we all have to start moving forward safely. And hopefully that will include a lot of moving, right, Jordan? Absolutely.
All right, take care everyone, stay safe. To find out more about our full slate of events, of digital events, please visit timesevents.nytimes.com. And finally, we want to give a special thank you to all of our subscribers. You make our work possible. We look forward to speaking with all of you again. And see you later, Dr. Metzl. Bye-bye, thank you guys.